Caliber Variety Show that takes place right here on the TDO Network. My name is Nicholas Brownlee, and if you've been following us in this mini-series, uh, we've been breaking down great moments in opera, specifically by voice type, and how they, and sort of just talking about what we hear as professional singers when we go into the opera house ourselves, and what we think about when we listen to the great singers of all time. Now, uh, if you're wondering, I, I'm wearing my denim today. I'm wearing my, my Carhartt pants. You'll just have to trust me. And uh, I'm doing it because we're talking about the working man's fog today. We're talking about the great basses of the world. I myself am a bass. Now, uh, I've been sort of dreading this day and having to break down the greats of my uh, fog because before I've sort of had the privilege of ignorance. And it was just this bass talking about sopranos and saying what he thought he knew was right. And then he could laugh and be like, oh, he doesn't know anything. Well, I'm supposed to know something, so I'm very nervous, but I'm super stoked uh, to break down these moments. And you may be wondering, of course, uh, anything from Papageno to King Philip uh, falls in the bass category. But today we're going to stay firmly in the bass world, bass profondo world, because I think it's probably the most rarest voice type, uh, most rare, rarest voice type on the planet. Um, and so we're going to break down this great moment that comes just after the Grand Inquisitor and King Philip scene and got Don Carlo. All you need to know is that uh, the King Philip got a new boo. She's really young. She's the queen. Don Carlo, his adult son, it falls in love with her and she falls in love with him. And then King Philip's like, I got to kill you now. And so he brings in the Inquisitor, who's like the cardinal. And he says, look, will God forgive me more? Or will you forgive me and the church forgive me? Um, and... Uh, what you know basically what if i kill my son and he says well we'll forgive you but an eye for an eye but you got to kill posa who is king philip's one of king philip's best friends now that's all that's a snapshot quick uh synopsis of don carlo and in this moment this is the king saying after that scene he's saying Dunque il trono pietado fray. he's saying basically uh i guess the throne always has to bow to the church relevant yes sir let's go let's go Church versus state, been a long problem. Uh, so let's get right into it. First up, we're gonna, uh, we're just gonna listen to it, James Morris. <laughs> Regardless of how it goes, it's an incredible moment. Now, this um, this it, it, it should be said. The reason this is such a difficult passage is because it's Don Quello Trono Piegado Fray Sebratore. So that means F to F, the highest note a bass is generally asked to sing on stage to the lowest note a bass is generally asked to sing on stage in a one measure period uh, at the at, at the end of one of the biggest scenes in opera. And right before this came his big. Uh, opening act for nine minute aria, right? And voices warm up. That's also true of basses. We don't warm down. So the basement starts to get a little higher on us. So that's why this moment is so difficult and why someone like James Morris, who is not traditionally known as a bass, he was more of a bass baritone. He sang all the really high Wagner repertoire, Voltan and uh, Voltan, Voltan and uh, Hollander and all of those big things, Dutchman. So um, here, you hear him a little bit bottom out on the bottom, but honestly, that F is totally acceptable for me for someone like James Morris. Now, you may want to go watch this whole clip because uh, we got a lot of people to get to because Sam Raimi sings this. <laughs> Literally the best low E that's ever been sung in this scene with him on this Tucker Gala. Well, just to be in that room. So um, because Sam Raimi sang that that great E, we're obviously Sam's one of the greatest basses to ever live. Uh, we're gonna not include him in this King Philip, but what an incredible night that was. So let's listen to James Morse one more time, just sort of the introductory clip, and we'll get into some more specifics. <laughs> Up next, 
if you've been following along in this series, um, I'm always trying to find a good representation of multi-generational uh, singers. Um, and so old schools that we know, new schools that we may not know, and somewhere in between great singers that sort of are deep cuts for us professionals who we listen to that may not be mainstream voices. And I think the next one falls under this category. Uh, Michele Pertuzzi is very, 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 very famous in Europe, uh, specifically in, in Italy. Um, but in America, we may not know him very much, but he's one of the absolute best low voices in the world. And so this to me is one of the best versions of the high F that we hear in all of these clips. Take it away, Michele. <laughs> Conductor lets you, why not? Like, if you have a good one. Now, what I hear in this clip is very interesting. So, Pertuzzi sang, um, sings, he's still around, um, he sings with this very, this sort of dark color, which is funny because that dark, that dark color is what we know as being the bass sort of color, that bass, oh, oh, that bass standard color. Whereas we hear James Morris sings with a very, eh, yeah, very brighter, very brighter, more uh, Germanic. Uh, honestly, a more German sound, which is why he's saying all that German rap. Bertuzzi is all about the color. And so, obviously, the high F is unbelievable. He seems really, I mean, it's dunque il trono, so it's a, what we would call in the business a closed O. So there's two O's in Italian. There's trono and there's trono. There's open and closed. And it, that's a longer story that I'm not going to open that bag of worms now. But technically, it's trono, it's closed, which helps him go dunque il trono instead of dunque il trono. So this is very important for you to listen to because a lot of women, for the most part, when they go up, they go, ah. When boys... When low voice men, at least, go up, we think, oh. So the difference is, oh, and ah. It's a very uh, different thing because women primarily sing in head voice. Woo, right? And, and low voice men primarily sing in chest voice. So we're constantly trying to get the most out of this, and women are constantly trying to get the most sparkle out of this. It's just an interesting note. So let's listen to Michele again and really focus on, is he singing dunque il tra or is he singing dunque il tra no? Interesting. <laughs> to the end. Okay, uh, up next is uh, a classic. You should just know him. I'm just going to start to clear. spectacular, right? So Boris Krisov, uh was a Bulgarian um, opera, was a Bulgarian bass, very, very, very famous bass. He's, he's most famous probably for Boris Gudnov, uh, his namesake, I guess. Um, so he's most, most known for sort of Russian heavy dark music, and you can really hear that. Um, and, and to go back and read the reviews of him, uh, because I'm just a total nerd and I do that all the time. When you go back and read these reviews of him, literally every review is like, he's a lion. It sounds like a lion, roar, a lion roaring and everyone else is just trying to scream to keep up. So this sound was just all encompassing huge throat. Um, and, and that's true, but I, not to generalize, but a lot of Eastern Europeans... Um, because of because of whatever it is in their genetics, their their Eastern Europeans, Russian Orthodox especially, are known for having these very low voices, these very heavy voices. They train for it, um, but it's not enough to train for it. They're also 
Um, there are also literally years and years and years of, of that sound and that world. They're in that sound world of just, because uh, they really uh, value that low voice, that low bass sound. And, and it's true. There is something so spiritual to it. Well, a, a voice that low, there's something so rattling about it. There's something that, in the same way that when, uh, you know, Rachel Gilmore sings the highest note at the Met ever in A flat or whatever, it sounds, it's your way, it goes, goes against God and everything else. In the same way that these low notes sort of do that as well. And so you really hear at all expense, diction wise, it doesn't matter what the words he's saying. I mean, God love him. Christoph is amazing. He's not really worried about any of that. He's just worried about making the biggest, roundest, darkest, manliest, Sorry to gender it, but the most real, honest sound that he can make. And he does that. Um, I would encourage you, if you don't know Boris Kristoff, go listen to Boris Kristoff. Boris Kristoff is bae. So, again, pay attention how um, Boris sounds like Boris, right? We talked about the three big things. Is it in tune? In big moments in opera, is it in tune? Is it homogenous? Does it sound like the same person? And then tone quality. And for me, Boris is a, a check, check, check. Roll Tide, I think his is fantastic. Let's listen to Boris's mammoth sound. So um, with my podcast and with, uh, with the different things that I have, I've been afforded a, the luxury of sitting down with a lot of incredible singers and a lot of um, current singers and past singers. And, and one of those, I got to sit down and interview for like an hour and a half, Sam Raimi. Um, and it was for me, this huge moment. I mean, Sam is, Sam is OG. He's Bay. He's an incredible, incredible artist and an incredible man, actually. He was so kind, so gentle and so wonderful and warm and open and, and and so I, I posed him the question I said who's the greatest to ever do it like who's the greatest bass because in my head it's basically Sam Raimi and everybody else and um and and he just looked at me Siepi and I was like wait so it's just and he was like Siepi ball game that's it and I was like okay cool I guess we got our answer so um so how can I do this without including the clip of Siepi so let's listen to Siepi do it this is Cheers that I Siepi So it, obviously that's incredible, but it was also live. Remember what we talked about? This is like a full production too. So it's like he just sang the aria. He did this huge, massive high duet. And then he's able to sort of recalibrate and get right back down. Because what you may not know is you, to go, you immediately, you got to come right back down to center. Because the same, the thing that works up top in the voice is the exact opposite of what works in the bottom. So in the top, you just have to basically go, ah, and just hope it stays together and you can go up. In the bottom, you have to go, ah. It's a total different mechanism. Um, and basically what you're asking your vocal folds to do, this is what the vocal folds look like, by the way, and they oscillate like this, and then singing happens. It's really fun. So quick, 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 quick lesson. So the, you're asking the chords, what makes high notes is when the chords stretch out like this, right? That's what makes high notes, and that's what makes all the, the vibrations faster, therefore the high notes go faster. So then you're asking the chords, if they're most stretched, right? They're most stretched, within two measures, you're asking them to release, relax into their least stretched. That is a very, very difficult thing to do. You're basically asking your chords to go from a sauna to a cold bath in two measures. You're asking them to be as completely warm as they can be and then as cold as they can be. After sitting in the sauna for four, for basically four hours at this point. So it's a very, very difficult note, and that's why you'll hear some basses bottom out. 
give them grace, baby, because that's really tough. <laughs> that's really hard. CFB, however, doesn't do that. CFB just really steps on the high F, re-regulates all the way down, and manages to sing a really beautiful, really powerful, strong low F at the end. Let's hear CFB again. Sam Raimi was right, no? Next one. So finding sort of like a young and up and coming version of, of this is very difficult because two things weren't built in a day, Rome and a great bass voice. Bass voices have to cook for a very long time. This repertoire should be started around 45, honestly. 40, 40, 45 is when you should sing your first King Philip. I mean, really, it's crazy um, how long it takes. And so you can find yourself as a bass often in your prime, if you've taken care of everything, in your 50s, which is pretty pretty amazing and uh, an and, and illustrious long career if, if you can wait it out. Uh, it's the reason why we don't have a lot of bases because that waiting it out time is so difficult. Like, you don't want to be a 35-year-old living on a friend's, you know, basement mattress just waiting it out because some guy on Nick at Nine said, if I just wait, I'll just be able to sing King Philip when I'm 50. I know, it's tough. Um, but if you do wait it out, you can get someone like Ferruccio Furlinetto, Furlinetto, who is my probably favorite bass of the time. And now what's crazy about Furlinetto is he's in his 60s and he's still one of the best King Phillips on earth. And if it wasn't for Corona, he literally would have sung this three months ago at Royal Opera House, um, where this recording comes from. So it's pretty amazing that Furlinetto has been doing this for so many years. Um, so he is proof that the, the match process waiting it's like a fine wine and uh, we are all so so lucky to sit at um, at the at the hand of Frulinetto and still have him around to hear him so I'm only gonna play this one once and then we'll get to our last clip this is Fruitsville Frulinetto just being incredible Get a chance to see Ferlinetto do anything, go, run, get a ticket. I saw Listen, I, I know that opera seems so elitist, right? People come in their gowns and there's money and there's, you know, all of this stuff that's happening. And I, I get it. I get that it's fancy. I understand that it's a fancy thing. Um, I appreciate that it's a fancy thing to some degree, but I don't come from that at all. And, I, and a lot of my, 90% of my colleagues also don't come from that. Um, Opera is this incredible thing that I think can touch anyone at any time. For me, I'm just a regular dude from Alabama, and I've just had an immense amount of guiding voices and guiding hands on my shoulders, and I continue to have that, you know, guiding me and pushing me through this opera world, and I'm so grateful for all the help and the privileges that I've been afforded um, throughout this time. And, and when I think about someone that exemplifies this, it's Paul Plishka. Paul Plishka, uh, to, to my ears, had one of the most extraordinary, beautiful, incredible bass voices of all time. He had this like, yeah, snarl, snarl sort of American, he, he exemplified the American sound. It wasn't, oh, uh, it was, yeah, we do this, you know, because we've got these big houses to fill. So we have such big opera houses here that, oh, uh, doesn't really go very far, but uh, it does. And I know that might not make a lot of sense to you, but it, it's sort of a singer, a singer for singer joke. Um, Paul Pushka exemplified that, and I got to meet him, and he was as lovely as you could have ever imagined. He, he is in the top 10 list for most performances ever performed at the Met. He could have had this huge, illustrious career uh, uh, internationally, but he chose to do 95% of his performing 
in the States and specifically at the Met. And, and that's a special thing. Um, that is, he is the ultimate New Yorker from Pennsylvania, but the ultimate New Yorker. He is the kindest man in the world. When you walk into the theater, every single person says hey to him. He's an, he's an actual living legend and living icon. And this performance of this particular moment it's one of the most perform uh, famous DVDs of Don Carlo out there from 1980. Renata Scotto, uh, Paul Pushka, I mean, you, you just name it. Uh, Cheryl Milnes, uh, it's just an incredible cast. Um, and specifically, hit this scene with Jerome Hines, another one of the great bass baritones, who's also grew up at, randomly as a farmer. Um, their scene is so powerful. And what he does at the end is sort of like, you sort of feel it in Paul Pushka. He's like, well, damn, I'm just getting off stage with Jerome Hines. I got to do something here. Um, and so Paul Pushka, after all this emotion, after literally, after his El Jemai Mamo, his aria, the tickets were torn up and thrown on stage because they were just like, this is incredible, you know, freaking out. And he's still able to get it together and to, to re-regulate all of the things we talked about. He does so beautifully. And he does, I think, the best version of this because it's got so much heart in it. And for me, we can talk about the technique and we can talk about a lot of those things, but it all comes down to heart. That's the point of opera. It hits you right here. And for me, Paul Pushkas hits me right here. Thank you guys for joining me. I know I talked a lot this episode, but hey, I'm a bass talking about basses. What are you going to do? I hope you enjoyed Paul Pushka. Peace out, everybody. And to all those in Texas, please stay safe and stay warm. Love you guys.